Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. In this episode, I'm sharing a chapter from the book Nevermore – The Haunted Life and Mysterious Death of Edgar Allan Poe by Troy Taylor for the audiobook version but this chapter by itself was so interesting to me while I was narrating it, I thought it'd make a great episode of Weird Darkness, just by itself. Plus, it gives you a little peek into what you might get if you purchase the book itself. I've left a link to the book in the show notes. What I'm about to share is the true story about a murder of a girl who worked in a cigar shop, the investigation of it by law enforcement, how Edgar Allan Poe saw it as an opportunity to escalate his career and name, and how it all almost blew up in his face, even with some claiming Poe was the murderer of the poor girl. If you're new here, welcome to the show, and while you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, my newsletter, to enter contests, connect with me on social media. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. Men have called me mad, but the question is not yet settled. Whether madness is or is not the loftiest intelligence, whether much that is glorious, whether all that is profound does not spring from disease of thought, from moods of mind exalted at the expense of the general intellect. Edgar Allan Poe On July 28, 1841, two New Yorkers were walking along the Hoboken shoreline near the spring at Sybil's Cave, then a popular tourist attraction, when they spotted a body floating out in the Hudson River. As they waited on shore for the coroner to arrive, a man walked up to them and claimed that he recognized the corpse from its clothing. It was, he told them, the body of Mary Cecilia Rogers, the missing woman who had recently been in the papers. Her life story is a bit murky, but Mary Rogers was probably born in Lyme, Connecticut in 1820. She and her widowed mother, Phoebe, moved to Manhattan in the 1830s. Phoebe opened a boarding house at 126 Nassau Street, and Mary took a sales job at Anderson's Tobacco Emporium which had become a fixture of New York's emerging social scene. It was especially popular with young men and local writers such as Washington Irving and James Fenimore Cooper, but while the customers came for owner John Anderson's tobacco, they stayed for Mary, who was dubbed the Beautiful Cigar Girl by the local press. Within a year of starting work at the cigar shop, Mary had become a local celebrity, even sparking a short-lived panic when she failed to show up for work one day in 1838. Though what made headlines, this disappearance was dismissed as a publicity stunt for Anderson's store. But was it? No one knows, but soon afterward Mary left her position at the store and returned home to help her mother run her business. While her life was more private at the boarding house, she still managed to attract a lot of attention from men. She had a lot of admirers who stayed at and hung around the house, but Mary gave all her attention to Daniel Payne, a cork cutter and boarder who became her fiancé in the summer of 1841. Daniel would also become the last person to see Mary alive, other than her killer, that is. On the morning of July 25th, Mary left the Rogers boarding house telling her mother that she planned to visit an aunt uptown. What happened after that, as the hours without word from her turned to days, remains unknown. At first, it was suggested that she had simply run away, perhaps in another attempt to get attention. 
Daniel, though, worried about the gangs of robbers and rapists whose exploits were then filling the pages of the papers. After two days of searching, growing more convinced that Mary had been kidnapped, he had a missing notice printed. The notice caught the eye of a man named Arthur Cromelian. He was a former boarder at her mother's house and had once courted Mary. He took his search across the ferry to Hoboken, arriving just in time to witness the recovery of Mary's body from the Hudson River and to identify the corpse. After he was questioned by the police and they were convinced that Cromelian's arrival on the scene didn't implicate him in the murder, the authorities turned their attention to other lead suspects. One of the first people they questioned was John Anderson, Mary's employer who had often accompanied her home in the evenings. Even though he could offer no alibi for the day of her disappearance, he was released when attention began to focus on Mary's fiancé, Daniel Payne. Not only was he the last person to see Mary alive, but there were rumors that the couple had been fighting and that Mary had threatened to call off the wedding. None of that turned out to be true, and after Daniel produced a solid alibi, the case quickly went cold. Meanwhile, newspapers all over the country kept a running commentary about the case, especially in regard to what they claimed was the bungling investigation by the New York police. One report complained about the slovenly manner in which the coroner at Hoboken performs his duties, while outside Philadelphia, other papers wondered if the death had been a suicide. Even New York Governor William H. Seward got involved, announcing in several New York papers a $750 reward for any information that helped solve the crime. Then, in early September 1841, there seemed to be a break in the case. A group of boys were playing in a field in Weehawken, New Jersey, not far from where Mary's body had been found, and discovered bundles of bloody clothing in some bushes. After the discovery in what came to be called the murder thicket, one of the boys' mothers, Frederica Loss, who operated the nearby Nick Moore House pub, contacted the police. But Frederica Loss seemed to know a lot more about the case than just about the discovery of bloody clothes. When the police questioned her, she admitted that Mary Rogers had checked in to the Nick Moore house on the night of her death with an unknown man. The pair had gone out but had never returned to the pub. Frederica said that she didn't think too much of it at the time, but remembered hearing someone screaming in the woods later that night. Although it seemed strange that she never shared this with the police before now, detectives were apparently satisfied with her answers. Things took another turn less than a month later, on October 7th, when Daniel Payne made a trip to the murder thicket after spending the evening drinking in Hoboken. While sitting on a nearby bench, he drank an entire bottle of laudanum and died from an overdose. His body was found only a few hundred yards from where Mary's corpse had been discovered. A note in his pocket read, To the world, here I am on the spot. God forgive me for my misfortune in my misspent time. Without easy answers, the press once again created their own version of events. As a single working woman, Mary became a kind of symbol for the era's problems and a warning to parents about the fate that might befall their own daughters in the big city. Many papers even claimed, with no evidence of course, that Mary had been a prostitute and even hinted that she deserved her fate. The New York public might have been satisfied with such weak solutions, but in Philadelphia, Edgar Allan Poe was not. Mary's first disappearance had occurred while Poe was living in New York, and he remembered it well. As the news of her fate reached him through newspaper reports, he became obsessed with the story and followed every detail. Poe was now living well in Philadelphia. His annual salary of $800 from Graham's Magazine, although far from a fortune, afforded him a stability like none he'd ever had in his adult life. By the end of 1841, he'd moved his wife and mother-in-law into a small townhouse on Coates Street in the north end of the city. As he'd promised long ago in Richmond, he was finally providing Virginia with the kind of comfort she deserved. Their new home was even furnished with a small piano, a harp, and a pair of songbirds in a gilded cage. On January 20, 1842, the day after Poe turned 33, a small group of friends gathered in the parlor of the townhouse to hear Virginia play the harp and sing. It was a perfect evening. Virginia was wearing a white gown and looked angelic in the firelight. As she tapped at the keys of the piano, she sang. The notes became higher, true and clear, and then stopped. Virginia clutched at her throat and then choked out a cascade of blood 
staining the front of her dress with crimson. Poe's face went white. He carried Virginia upstairs, laid her on the bed, and then ran for a doctor. Poe must have known, even before the doctor grimly confirmed it, that the hemorrhage signaled the final stages of tuberculosis. He also must have known that her chances for survival were slim. By the time a patient begins coughing up blood, they were usually beyond help. Even if she could have been helped, perhaps by moving to a healthier climate or by a stay at a sanatorium, such things were well beyond the means of an editor making $800 a year. Virginia spent the next two weeks scarcely able to breathe except when fanned with fresh air. At times, her coughing became so severe that it seemed as if she would choke to death. She pressed a handkerchief to her mouth to cover it when she coughed, and it was often spattered red with blood. Heart aching, Poe remained by her side, brooding over the poverty-stricken existence that he had forced Virginia into as his wife that was now killing her. More than one visitor commented that the cramped house where they lived, luxurious compared to other places where they had lived, was likely making Virginia's condition worse. Her sick room was so small that the sloped roof was almost as low as her head. George Graham, Poe's employer, noted that Poe's love for his wife was a sort of rapturous worship of the spirit of beauty which he felt was fading before his eyes. I've seen him hovering around her when she was ill, with all the fond fear and tender anxiety of a mother for her firstborn, her slightest cough causing him to shudder, a heart chill that was visible. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. Virginia's health seeped into Poe's work most notably in the mentioned The Mask of the Red Death, published just months before the January attack. He dwelt on themes of horror and blood, because even then he knew what was coming. He'd seen it before with his mother when he was a small child. In Eleonora, also written in the early stages of Virginia's illness, Poe returned to the theme and delved into the grim circumstances of his new life. The story was about a young man, living an idyllic life with his young cousin Eleonora and her mother. All too soon, though, Eleonora tells him that she had seen that the finger of death was upon her bosom, that, like the ephemeron, she had been made in perfect loveliness only to die. In the months that followed, Poe wavered back and forth between optimism and utter despair. In February, he told friends that she was getting better, but by July, he declared that, I have scarcely a faint hope for her recovery. For a time, Poe threw himself into his work, writing poems, stories, and reviews for Graham's magazine and finding that his reputation was growing. When he learned that Charles Dickens would be touring Philadelphia in March 1842, he wrote to request an interview, sending along a copy of his Tales of the Grotesque and Arabesque. He also included copies of his past reviews for Dickens' work, attesting to admiration for the writer he once called the greatest British novelist. Among them was an article he wrote about the mystery Barnaby Rudge, written shortly after Dickens' story began to appear in serial form. Although the book's conclusion would not be published for several months, Poe was able to predict, correctly, that Barnaby, the idiot, is the murderer's own son. Dickens was impressed by Poe. He gave two lengthy interviews to him at Philadelphia's United States Hotel on March 7, 1842. Dickens took particular note of Poe's reviews and would later describe him as a man who taketh all of us English men of letters to task in print, roundly and uncompromisingly. Even though the interview was part of his work for Graham's, Poe used it to his own advantage, 
by the end of the meeting, Dickens had agreed to help Poe find a publisher in England. The two men parted on good terms and Dickens' work would make itself felt in Poe's own work, especially in the case of the talkative raven that appears within the pages of Barnaby Rudge. Despite his position at Graham's being the best job that Poe had ever had, he began to fall into the same resentful state of mind that had led to difficulties at his earlier positions. No one recognized the greatness of Edgar Allan Poe like Poe himself did. In this case, though, Poe did have some actual cause for irritation. The magazine's extraordinary success was making a fortune for Graham, but Poe's salary had stayed the same. He now considered them so pitiful that it was almost an insult. As gloom set in over Virginia's illness, his bitterness deepened. On the morning after the initial hemorrhage, Poe asked Graham to advance him two months' salary to help ease the unexpected burden. Graham refused. At the same time, the success of Graham's rekindled Poe's hopes for a magazine of his own. This was another source of grievance against his employer, however. Graham had promised when Poe joined his magazine that he would help to launch Poe's own pen magazine within a year. But as Graham's grew in circulation and became more profitable, the promise was forgotten. Poe was a victim of his own success. He later wrote, "...every exertion made by myself served to make Graham's a greater source of profit and left its owner less willing to keep his word with me." The matter reached a crisis point in April 1842. After a brief time away caused by illness, Poe returned to the office to find that his duties had been taken over by Charles Peterson, an associate editor. It may be that Peterson simply covered for Poe while the other man was away, but we only know Poe's side of it, and he was offended. Always sensitive about his status as an editor, he believed that he had been slighted and perhaps even passed over for a promotion. So, he quit. As usual, there would be a difference of opinion as to whether Poe left or was fired. Graham later said, either Peterson or Poe would have to go. The two cannot get along together. Poe insisted that he left to pursue his own interests, citing his disgust with the namby-pamby mainstream character of the magazine and the insulting salary. In contrast to his hostility toward Thomas White and William Burton, though, Poe spoke well of Graham and claimed to have no misunderstanding with him. Whatever the reason for leaving, Poe soon found himself broke again. With Virginia's illness adding to his worries, we can only puzzle over why Poe would make such a change. We can only assume that he simply couldn't help sabotaging himself. There were very few studies of mental illness in those days, and certainly there was no one who could get inside the head of Edgar Allan Poe. He often spoke of the nervous restlessness that haunted me as a fiend, as a reason for many of the things that he did that might seem baffling to others. He used the excuse of wanting to start a magazine of his own as a reason for leaving, but deep down he surely knew that he would never be able to afford. He was a man of incredible talent, but he seemed eager to destroy his reputation. This marked the beginning of what some have called Poe's irregularities, which for the rest of his life would destroy his hopes and put his reputation into the hands of people who hated him. Those irregularities began almost at once. For the most part, Poe had stayed away from liquor during his time at Graham's, but now he returned to the bottle with devastating consequences. As mentioned earlier, Poe had a dramatically low tolerance for alcohol. It wasn't how much he drank, it was that he drank at all. He seemed to have a strange reaction to it. At a time when dram shops and taverns lined the streets, Poe's lack of tolerance left him uniquely vulnerable. He could never stop with a single drink. Even the first drink transformed him from a personable man to a coarse, staggering drunk. His friend, Frederick Thomas, noted, if he took but one glass of weak wine or cider, it always ended in excess and sickness. Poe's excuses for drinking were plain enough. Virginia's illness, his poverty, his literary disappointments, but turning to alcohol always made things worse. For instance, over the course of the 14 months that he worked at Graham's, he made about $1,000 in salary and contributors' fees. His literary income over the next three years added up to only $121, all thanks to the bottle. Poe now abandoned his writing, or at least began to supplement it with less taxing forms of work. 
although he still dreamed of starting his own magazine. He also pursued the possibility of a job at the Philadelphia Customs House. It was a government job, and it paid well. But Poe failed to get a local appointment, so he traveled to Washington in hopes of pleading his case directly to President Tyler, whose son Robert was a fan of Poe's writing. Nervous about the important interview, he attempted to calm his nerves with a glass of port. Soon after, he was seen stumbling around the city with a green tint to his face and his coat turned inside out. Poe did not meet the president, nor did he make a favorable impression on anyone who might have helped him to obtain the employment he was seeking. Back at his writing desk, Poe sought new publishers for some of his magazine stories. Earlier, while working at Graham's, he had written to Lee and Blanchard, the publishers of Tales of the Grotesque and Arabesque, to offer a revised collection of his work, expanded to include some new stories like The Murders in the Rue Morgue. They declined, replying that they had not yet sold out of the first edition. Despite the refusal, Poe did hope to work with them again in the future. His hopes may have been raised further when Lee and Blanchard published a book by William Gilmore Sims called Beauchamp, which took inspiration from the real-life Beauchamp Sharp murder case in 1825. That story had also been the inspiration for an unfinished work by Poe. Believe it or not, Poe actually admired William Gilmore Sims and had once called him immeasurably the best writer of fiction in America. So there's no doubt that he was aware of this book and, undoubtedly, took note of the way that Sims had crafted the true story into a popular novel. At the same time, he must have been irritated that Lee and Blanchard had accepted Sims' book and made it successful while declining Poe's collection of stories. In the uncertain days that followed the loss of his editor's position, Poe's mind must have turned in the direction of writing a story that was based on a well-known crime. Poe had every reason to feel that his skills in this area were as good or better than those of Sims. He had long made a specialty of solving puzzles and posing conundrums to his readers, ranging from coded messages to this recent success of The Murders in the Rue Morgue, but even then, Poe chided himself over the fact that while Rue Morgue had been clever, it suffered from the artificial contrivance of its solution. A puzzle, he would later write, created for the express purpose of unraveling. Poe wanted to fix his attentions on a crime that had not yet been solved. That, he knew, would be the true test of his skill. He could not be accused of constructing his own puzzle, nor would the reader know the solution until Poe himself provided it. This would not only make the story dramatically satisfying, but it would be proof of Poe's analytical reasoning. There's no record of how Poe chose the Mary Rogers case for his inspiration, although we do know that he had been following it since its start. He remembered the celebrated cigar girl from his time in New York and had followed the investigation from a distance. The story had gotten a lot of attention in Philadelphia, and the crime had been heavily reported on in the city's newspapers. The death of Daniel Payne in October had likely brought the case back to Poe's attention at a time when he was especially susceptible to writing another mystery story. In June 1842, Poe sent a letter to Joseph Evans Snodgrass, the Baltimore editor with whom he had remained friends over the years. Snodgrass had recently taken over the Baltimore Sunday Visitor, the same paper that had awarded a $50 prize to MS found in a bottle nearly ten years earlier. In the letter, Poe proposed a sequel to The Murders in the Rue Morgue, featuring a different crime that would be based on the murder of Mary Rogers. He would change the location to France, slightly alter the girl's name, and allow his detective, Dupin, to solve the mystery. At the same time, Poe would be entering into an analysis of the real tragedy in New York. He added, The press has been entirely on the wrong scent. In fact, I really believe not only have I demonstrated the falsity of the idea that the girl was the victim of a gang of ruffians, but have indicated the assassin. Poe truly believed that, through fiction, he could solve the real-life murder. For all his enthusiasm about the decision to revive Augusta Dupin for the new story, though, it likely had more to do with good business than solving a mystery. Rue Morgue had been widely praised when it was released, and to put it simply, Poe needed a hit. By presenting the new story as a sequel to a popular one, it could also serve as an enticement for a new collection of stories in the future. Poe's letter made it clear that he was not hedging his bets, 
it would be easy to move the Mary Rogers case to the safe distance of Paris. That way, if any of the details didn't match, he could blame it on the change of venue. But Poe implied that he would name the killer and solve the case. Was it just a ruse to make more money? Perhaps. Poe did go on to mention that if Snodgrass was unable to pay him at least $40, he could publish the story somewhere else. But that same day, he sent an identical letter to George Roberts, editor of the Boston Notion, adding that he really wanted to have the story published in Boston, and raised the price to $50. Neither man took the bait. It's possible that the price, modest as it was, seemed excessive when compared to the material they already had. At the time, magazine editors could take advantage of the total absence of international copyright restrictions by publishing any foreign authors they pleased. Although many editors made an effort to give preference to America's writers, there were many less expensive options at hand. Poe's bargain price for his story could not compete with the free material that was available from overseas. Concerned, Poe turned to William Snowden of The Ladies' Companion in New York. As you can imagine, it wasn't a particularly good match. Earlier that same year, Poe had complained about the contemptible pictures, fashion plates, music, and love tales that filled the pages of Graham's. The Ladies' Companion offered these same features many times over, and as the title clearly indicated, with the sensibilities of women in mind, Snowden worked to attract ladies of exquisite refinement and taste, though Poe would later deride the magazine for offering neither of those things. A typical issue in 1842 featured stories and poems with titles like Birth Night Reveries and The Smile of Love, along with commentary on the latest dresses and sheet music for popular new songs. Based on this, a story by Edgar Allan Poe seemed wildly out of place. And yet, it was in The Lady's Companion where the story would first appear. Snowden had good reasons for wanting to publish Poe's story. Snowden had been a member of a group of concerned New Yorkers called the Committee of Safety who'd been involved in trying to solve the murder of Mary Rogers. In fact, Snowden had been one of the largest contributors. The committee had been very disappointed when their efforts failed to produce any results. Nearly a year had passed, and yet Mary's killer still remained at large. In accepting Poe's story for publication, Snowden may have hoped to revive interest in the case and spark a renewed investigation. After completing the sale to the ladies' companion, Poe sank into a depression, largely brought on by the deterioration of conditions at home. He confessed to a friend, "...the state of my mind has, in fact, forced me to abandon all mental exertion. The renewed and hopeless illness of my wife, ill health on my part, and pecuniary embarrassments have nearly driven me to distraction." But there were more embarrassments over money to come. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. In October 1842, the issue of The Lady's Companion that contained The Mystery of Marie Roget rolled off the presses two weeks ahead of schedule. Poe's story was too long to be published in a single issue, so Snowden had divided it into three installments that would appear in three consecutive issues. Billed as a sequel to The Murders in the Rue Morgue, the first installment was stuck between an article about the Bible and a story called The Old Oak Chest by Mrs. Caroline Orne. Snowden's readers were accustomed to a quiet and morally uplifting tone in the magazine, and Snowden likely took a pause before releasing Poe's graphic, blood-drenched tale. Still, even though a year had passed since the death of Mary Rogers, Snowden knew 
that people were still fascinated by the fate of the beautiful cigar girl. Nearly every reader of The Lady's Companion would be familiar with the story and perhaps had even visited the area where her body had been found. Most would also be aware of the conflicting theories about the case and the fact that it was unsolved. Poe's story, no matter how unseemly in its details, was familiar ground for New Yorkers, even if the action had been transferred to Paris. Poe changed the names but kept most other details the same. And in case there was any doubt as to the inspiration of the story, Poe's unnamed narrator, the friend of C. Augusta Dupin, offered a clear statement of intent in the opening pages of the story, echoing the words that Poe had included in his letter to prospective publishers. The extraordinary details which I am now called upon to make public will be found to form, as regards sequence of time, the primary branch of a series of scarcely intelligible coincidences whose secondary or concluding branch will be recognized by all readers in the late murder of Mary Cecilia Rogers at New York. In reading the story, these coincidences, a term Poe used to indicate a calculated design rather than an accidental happening, soon became apparent. Poe introduces the working-class woman Marie Roger, the daughter of Estelle Roger, who keeps a boarding house. Marie had a job with a perfumer, Monsieur Leblanc, and the shop became notorious thanks to the charms of the lovely young woman. Readers soon learn that a man named Bervet wanted to marry her, but Marie became engaged to a man named St. Eustoc instead. After Marie had worked behind the counter of the perfumery for about a year, her admirers were thrown into confusion by her sudden disappearance from the shop. LeBlanc is unable to account for her absence. While the newspapers are calling for action and the police are getting ready to investigate, Marie reappears, in good health but with a somewhat saddened air. No explanation for her vanishing is offered except to say that it was a private matter. Five months later, Marie leaves home to visit an aunt but never arrives. After four days, her battered corpse is found floating in the Seine. And, well, you get the idea. It's the same story as that of Mary Rogers, just taking place in Paris. Poe was careful to insert a number of details taken from the official accounts of the Mary Rogers investigation, drawing in particular from statements by Daniel Payne and Alfred Cromelian, who are represented by St. Eustoc and Bervais. He also used the testimony of the Hoboken coroner, Dr. Cook, so that his story would mirror the actual murder. He used crucial details, indicating that a strip of fabric found at Marie's waist was tied in a sort of hitch, and that the strings of Marie's bonnet had been tied in a knot that was not a lady's but a slip or sailor's knot. As the story goes on, the details continue to run parallel with the events of the New York investigation. Although a speedy solution to the crime is expected, the police soon found her. False arrests are made, and rumors spread. Eventually, the scene of the murder is found in some woods near a public house owned by a woman named Deluc who claims to have seen Marie in the company of a young man of dark complexion. Finally, St. Eustoc is found dead with a vial of laudanum in his hand. In spite of this, the police make no progress in solving the case, which leads them to ask Dupin for help. The first installment ends with the narrator stating, I waited for some explanation from Dupin. He, along with the readers, had to wait until the magazine's next issue. As with the serial publication of Charles Dickens' novels, it was likely thought that spacing out the story would generate suspense and give Poe more time in which to turn the publicity to his advantage. Unfortunately, though, Snowden did a pretty poor job of dividing up the manuscript, cutting it without any regard for the flow of the story. The first section broke off almost in mid-sentence during a discussion of floating bodies, and the second ended abruptly in the middle of Dupin's contemplation of the murder scene. These interruptions did nothing to encourage the reader's continued interest. Regardless, Poe was encouraged by the warm response of friends and colleagues after the first installment appeared. His spirit lifted further when the conditions at home started to improve. Virginia's health had gotten better, and as he wrote to a friend, perhaps all will yet go well. Although Poe was still broke, he hoped that Marie Roger would restore some of the status that he'd lost after leaving Graham's and help secure his own dream of starting a literary journal. The second installment was supposed to appear during the third week in November, and the third and final section, which Poe knew would contain the dramatic solution, would be published during the holiday season. 
Poe was so confident of his deductive skills that he promised to solve the real-life case of Mary Rogers in the final section of his story. He wrote, "...all argument founded upon the fiction is applicable to the truth, and the investigation of the truth was the object." The conclusion of The Mystery of Marie Roget was going to be the talk of New York, he believed, and perhaps it would have been if not for an incident that brought the name Mary Rogers back into the newspapers and derailed Poe's plans for a definite solution to his fictionalized mystery. On November 1, 1842, Frederica Loss, proprietor of Nick Moore's Tavern in Weehawken, was accidentally shot by one of her sons while he was cleaning his gun. She spent the next ten days dying in agony, babbling incoherently in a string of broken English and German. Hallucinating, she claimed that the spirit of a young woman was tormenting her and then made her final confession. As the New York Tribune reported it, Mary Rogers had come to Hoboken in company of a young physician who undertook to procure for her a premature delivery, in other words, an illegal abortion. Mary had died during the operation, after which Loss's sons had dumped the body in the river and scattered the clothes to avoid suspicion. Following their mother's death, the two eldest Loss sons were briefly charged in connection with Mary's murder, implicated at least in the illegal disposal of a body. The lack of hard evidence, other witnesses, and Mrs. Loss's condition during her confession were too much for the court, however, and the case against them was quickly dismissed. The police did turn their attentions to a Madame Restel, a female physician and professor of midwifery who had a career as an abortionist that was so well-known that some called her the wickedest woman in New York. Madame Restel, whose real name was Anne Tro Lohman, had come to New York from England in 1831 and started on a professional path that would earn her an estimated $1 million and a lavish Fifth Avenue brownstone that was dubbed the mansion built on baby skulls. At the time of Mary Rogers' death, Madame Restell was also in the news. In July 1841, just days before Mary's body was discovered, she was tried in New York's Court of Special Sessions for administering certain noxious medicine and procuring a miscarriage by the use of instruments the same not being necessary for the preservation of life. Abortion was still a misdemeanor at the time, but the case in which Madame Restell was being tried had resulted in the death of the patient. This elevated her charge to murder. In the end, she was convicted and sentenced to spend a year in prison, but never served the time. At the time, Madame Restell ran her business from a house on Chambers Street, not far from Phoebe Rogers' boarding house and steps away from City Hall. The fashionable address allowed her to draw customers from every social class in New York. She also ran a network of abortion shops that stretched across the river to Hoboken. The newspapers were filled with the possible story of ties between Madame Restell and Mary Rogers, but the Police Gazette worked especially hard to draw a link between the abortionist and the cigar girl. After the death and alleged confession of Frederica Loss, the rumors and suppositions assumed the tone of established fact. Although there was no official connection between Restell and Loss, it was assumed that Nick Moore's Tavern was one of the abortion shops under Restell's management. Some accused Loss of performing an operation on Mary Rogers, while others suggested that she had simply provided the facilities for an anonymous physician. As mentioned, Horace Greeley's Tribune was the first newspaper to go on record and claim that Mary had died as the result of an abortion. It would not be the last, despite the fact that there was no actual evidence of it. As soon as the story ran, however, Justice Gilbert Merritt, who had overseen the investigation of the case, stepped forward to smother the claims. He insisted that the newspaper had gone too far with its reporting. He stated that the story was inaccurate and that he did not receive a confession from Mrs. Loss, who was in a deranged state of mind. But the Tribune refused to back down. Although Greeley admitted that he had made an error when saying the confession had been made directly to Merritt, he continued to insist that a confession had been made. We gave the facts as they were told to us by two magistrates of his city, he insisted, and we understood them on the authority of a statement made by Mr. Merritt himself to Mayor Morris. The editors of the competing New York Herald were thrilled to see that Greeley's paper had botched the story. To underscore the mess, they reprinted the Tribune's original story and then reprinted Merritt's denial right next to it. 
when Greeley repeated his claim that two magistrates had corroborated the story, the Herald demanded their names. The Tribune declined to respond. Justice Merritt, meanwhile, stayed out of the public fray. In spite of his denials about the story, he firmly believed that the events had transpired the way the Tribune had reported it, and that Mrs. Loss's sons were also involved. He just didn't have the evidence to prove it. On November 19th, a week after the death of Frederica Loss, a hearing was convened in the Court of Justice Stephen Lutkins of Jersey City. Mrs. Loss's two oldest sons were subjected to a grueling round of questions, designed to expose the nefarious nature of the Nick Moore house and their mother's role in the death of Mary Rogers. By all accounts, the hearing was a confused and disappointing affair. A team of lawyers working for the Laws family objected to most of the questions, and the sons easily turned aside the accusations against them, dismissing the most serious charges as nothing but hearsay. The hearing closed on an inconclusive note, with no charges being filed, but this didn't stop the city's newspapers from reuniting behind the idea that Mary had died during an abortion. The case remained legally unexplained, but it was believed that the recent statement of the manner of her death is true. Again, though, this seems hard to believe. At the initial inquest, the coroner had stated that Mary had been brutally violated by no fewer than three assailants, but also asserted that, prior to that, Mary had been a virgin. According to the new theory of the crime, the coroner had mistaken evidence of a horribly botched abortion with a sexual assault, which seemed unlikely. If true, though, it left other questions unanswered. Mary had been found with a lace cord tied around her neck and deep fingerprint bruises on her throat. Whatever may have clouded the coroner's mind about her feminine region, he had been perfectly clear about the evidence for strangulation. He described in detail the mark left by the lace cord and the bruises in the shape of the man's fingers. A bungled abortion, no matter how horrific, could not account for the clear signs of the young woman being strangled. The theory also failed to account for the behavior of Mrs. Loss and her sons. The discovery of Mary's clothing in the murder thicket brought attention to Mrs. Loss and the Nick Moore house. If, in fact, Mrs. Loss had been operating an abortion shop there, why would she have called attention to herself? Up to the point where she came forward with Mary's personal effects, there had been no connection between the tavern and the murder. But even with all the doubts and contradictions, the idea that Mary had perished during an abortion became the solution to the case for the public. Newspapers began declaring that the mystery has at last been solved. This eagerness to accept an unproven solution had more to do with a sense of public outrage than evidence. Thanks to the abortion angle, as well as the many editorials crying out for reform and punishment for Madame Restell, the Mary Rogers story took on a new and even darker atmosphere. At the same time, Mary herself began to be seen in a different and unflattering light. If the accusations against Mrs. Loss were true, then the beautiful cigar girl could no longer be seen as an innocent victim. She was now an unfortunate, if not entirely blameless, victim of a barbaric practice. She was to be pitied for certain, but she was also a casualty of her own sins. In the middle of all of this, though, it was easy for people to overlook the fact that it had not been clearly established that an abortion had actually taken place. By the end of November, the uproar in the press had subsided, though further developments were expected. Newspapers hoped that a final resolution would be coming soon. For now, they admitted, there was nothing further to be learned. As one stated, this mysterious matter sleeps for the present. For Poe, this new drama in Weehawken could not have come at a worse time. The third and final installment of Marie Roger, which included his solution to the case, was only days away from publication. Until the news of Mrs. Loss's confession and death, Poe believed that he had crafted an elegant and entirely plausible theory. Now, as the idea that Mary Rogers had died during an abortion was spreading like wildfire, Poe's conclusion would be proved false opening him up to devastating public humiliation at the very time that he was trying, again, to restore his reputation. The critics would be ruthless. There were many in New York that had not forgotten the stinging reviews that he had printed in the Southern Literary Messenger. There was also the delight he had taken in savaging Theodore Fay's book, which had also been inspired by a sensational murder case. 
Poe had gone out of his way to sneer at the poetical licenses that Faye had taken. Now that Poe had done the same thing, he could only imagine the reviews that were going to tear him apart. There are very few among those with a love for the supernatural who don't also have a passion for Edgar Allan Poe. Poe wasn't simply a melancholy author who wrote about premature burials, sinister black hats, and talking ravens. He was much more. If you've ever read a modern mystery or horror novel, you can thank Poe. Poe invented the modern mystery story, mostly invented science fiction, and was the first writer to take the horror stories of the Gothic era and set them in modern times, starting a trend that continues today. With a lifelong interest in Poe, Troy Taylor decided to take his own look at the mysterious and macabre writer, his tragic life, unexplained death, and lingering hauntings. He invites listeners along to delve into the strange and bizarre world of Edgar Allan Poe, from his early life to his tragic marriage, his insane grief, his dramatically failed career, his links to an unsolved murder and the mystery of what happened to the writer in the five days before his unexplained death. Even more than a century and a half later, no one knows what happened to Poe before he was found delirious on the streets of Baltimore, Maryland, or what killed him. Why did he disappear and then show up in an incoherent state, wearing another man's clothes? Where did he go when he vanished and who was the mysterious Reynolds that Poe whispered about in his dying breath? And perhaps strangest of all, does he haunt the mysterious graveyard where his body is buried? Nevermore, The Haunted Life and Mysterious Death of Edgar Allan Poe, written by Troy Taylor, narrated by Darren Marlar. Find a link to the book on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Humiliation was bad enough, but if the critics tore apart Marie Roget, and his plans for launching his own literary magazine, which he planned to call The Stylus, would be destroyed. In the last months of 1842, as the first of the Ladies' Companion installments appeared, Poe began discussions with the influential Philadelphia editor Thomas C. Clark about financing the magazine. When Clark agreed to enter into a partnership with him, Poe had every reason to believe that his dream would soon be realized. He told a friend that George Graham had recently made him a good offer to return to Graham's, but he felt so sure about the deal to launch the stylus that he declined. As he wrote to the friend, the difficulties that impeded me last year have vanished and there will now be nothing to prevent success. Poe desperately needed that success. His financial problems had worsened and sent him to new depths of poverty. Worse yet, according to his friend Frederick Thomas, Poe had started drinking again to excess, leaving his home and his sick wife in a state of agitation and despair. An acquaintance who ran into him during this time described how Poe begged him for 50 cents so that he could buy a meal. Then in November, Poe's plans for the stylus were dealt a serious blow. The financing of the magazine had been contingent on Poe getting that position at the Philadelphia Customs House, the job prospect he had ruined by being drunk. That was followed the very next day by the news of the developments in Weehawken. That news was printed in a Philadelphia newspaper under the headline, New York Mystery Solved. Poe knew that he had to act at once. The first two installments of the story had already either appeared or were just about to in the case of the second part. The third and final installment, with the solution, was scheduled for the following month and may have already been set in type. If it appeared as originally written, Dupin's theories would look completely misguided, considering what was now happening. Even more embarrassing, all of Poe's brash claims at the start of the story about his own solution to the mystery would be exposed as having been an empty boast. It was too late for Poe to make any changes to the first two installments of the story, but the third and final section was still in the hands of William Snowden. Changes could be made. Poe calculated the odds, picked up his pen, and began trying to plot his way out of the mess that he found himself in. As he struggled to salvage his story, Poe took a close look at what he had already written and then tried to rework the fiction and facts to build a new theory. He drew a clear parallel between Marie's disappearance from the perfumery 
and the episode from the life of Mary Rogers when she vanished for a brief time from the tobacco shop in 1838. In Dupin's mind, the murder and the earlier disappearance had to be viewed as two parts of a single event. If so, the man who lured Marie away from home in 1838 and the man she went to meet on that fateful day in 1841 were one and the same. In linking the two disappearances in this way, Poe opened a new line of thought. Although the earlier disappearance had not been completely overlooked in the New York investigation, the episode didn't draw much comment in connection with the murder. Poe suggested that the New York police had missed an opportunity by concentrating their energy only on the crime of 1841. Poe believed that by giving equal weight to the earlier disappearance, it would provide an entirely new way to track the murderer, which of course Dupin does in the story, suggesting that Marie planned to elope with a secret lover, not her fiancé, St. Eustoch, but the man she had disappeared with the first time. Dupin and Poe believed that the second episode was merely a continuation of the first event, not a second unrelated entanglement. But who was this mysterious man? This is where things get complicated. In the story, Dupin points to a young naval officer much noted for his debaucheries. Poe plucked this character from real life. In a New York Herald article from August 3, 1841, there's mention of this possibility. It read, This young girl, Mary Rogers, was missing from Anderson's store three years ago for two weeks. It is asserted that she was seduced by an officer of the U.S. Navy and kept at Hoboken for two weeks. His name is well known aboard his ship. These three lines are the only known reference to a naval officer being implicated in the affair, but Poe, through Dupin, fastened on this brief mention and whipped it into a theory of the crime. Once he explained his reasoning, Dupin boldly pronounced that the murderer would be captured, leaving the reader to believe that a resolution might be revealed in the real-life drama, too. But Poe had backed himself into a corner. The murders in the Rue Morgue had offered a tidy ending. Poe had no sooner laid out his conclusions than the murderer arrived with a knock at the door. This time would not be so easy, but it did promise an even more dramatic climax. It was a story that was happening in the real world at the same time that it was being played out on paper. Of course, this was Poe's biggest problem. Since the actual Mary Rogers investigation had failed to produce a solid arrest, Poe's story could not name a villain without deviating from established fact. Poe had sketched out a compelling theory, but he didn't leave himself a way to create a satisfying ending. Unlike Rue Morgue, there would be no climactic confrontation and no unmasking of the killer. When Poe ended his tale, he printed the name of the killer, but it was removed from the manuscript by the editors, or so he claimed. An editor's note explained, For reasons which we shall not specify, but to which many readers will appear obvious, we have taken the liberty of here omitting from the manuscript placed in our hands such portion as details following up the apparently slight clue obtained by Dupin. We feel it is advisable to state, in brief, that the result desired was brought to pass, that an individual assassin was convicted, upon his own confession, of the murder of Marie Roger, and the prefect fulfilled punctually, although with reluctance, the terms of his compact with the Chevalier. Poe leaves the reader to understand that Dupin's conjectures were entirely and brilliantly correct and that the villain was apprehended precisely along the lines of investigation he suggested. Instead of joining in the discovery, the reader is asked to accept that it happened offstage. Although it clearly states that Poe supplied the killer's identity in the story, the editor is cast in the role of a censor and removes the presumably thrilling details for unstated reasons of propriety. It's a clever way of handling it, but this bait-and-switch leaves the reader with a feeling of having missed an important part of the story. The third installment of The Mystery of Marie Roget appeared in February 1843 with no explanation for the delay of one month. The story made a startling impression on its readers, for whom the details of the Mary Rogers case were still closely recalled. In one review, critic Thomas Dunn English praised the story and noted its connection to the real-life unsolved case. He wrote, "...to this day, with the exception of the light afforded by the tale of Mr. Poe, in which the faculty of analysis is applied to the facts, the whole matter is completely shrouded in mystery. We think he had proven very conclusively that which he attempts. At all events, he has dissipated in our mind all belief that the murder was perpetrated by more than one. In 
Although Poe had no specific references to Mary Rogers' presumed death at the hands of an abortionist, he did strip away that idea that many still had about Mary being raped and murdered by a gang of men. This aligned well with the public perception of the case. The previous year, when it was thought that Mary had fallen victim to a gang of criminals, the newspapers had united in calling for a more efficient police force. But now, in the wake of Mrs. Loss's death and the drama that went with it, the editorial pages were calling for the law to crack down on abortionists. Any kind of publicity attached to the story was good for Poe. It put him back in the spotlight and restored his reputation. But it also had a few who were not fans of the writer to ask other questions about Poe. It was not long after the story was published that people began to speculate that perhaps Poe knew more about the real Mary Rogers case than he was willing to disclose. Did Poe know who the actual killer was and just couldn't name him in print? Later, Poe blurred the line between Mary Rogers and Marie Roger as best he could. He received many letters about the story from readers, including one that he responded to from George Eveleth in January 1848. Poe wrote, Nothing was omitted in Marie Roger but what I omitted myself. The naval officer who committed the murder confessed it, and the whole matter is well understood. But for the sake of relatives, this is a topic on which I must not speak further. This further increased the suspicion that Poe knew more than he was saying. John Ingram, an early biographer of Poe, later added to the confusion about the naval officer. Writing about the story in 1874, Ingram insisted that it was based in fact. Although the incidents of the tragedy differed widely from those recounted in the tale, the naval officer implicated was named Spencer. Ingram didn't elaborate further, and he offered no source for the identification of the officer, though it may have come from Sarah Helen Whitman, a young widow that Poe knew in his last years. Those who have followed up on this tantalizing clue have tracked it to a prominent seagoing family headed by a Captain William Spencer. At first glance, he seems to be a promising suspect. He was known to have been in New York in both 1838 and 1841, and his family was influential enough to cover up any scandals, as was assumed the naval officer's family did to keep him from being arrested. However, Captain Spencer would have been 48 years old at the time of Mary's murder, too old to be her young lover. However, Captain Spencer did have a nephew who would have been the right age. Philip Spencer was a young midshipman who was also in New York during the times in question. In 1842, a year after Mary was murdered, he was hanged at sea for attempting to start a mutiny, an incident that inspired Herman Melville's Billy Butt. But Poe's theory required the officer to have also been involved in Mary's disappearance in 1838 when Philip Spencer was a 15-year-old schoolboy at an academy 150 miles from the city. A more compelling theory places the blame on Daniel Payne, Mary's fiancé. His suicide at Weehawken certainly seems to point to a guilty conscience. In this theory, Payne learns that Mary's pregnant and helps her to arrange an abortion at the Lost Tavern. In gratitude, Mary agrees to marry him but then changes her mind after the procedure is finished. In a rage, Payne strangles her, but then, unable to live with himself, takes his own life two months later. This is an interesting idea because it accounts for both the abortion and for the obvious signs of death by strangulation. The problem, though, is that Payne had an alibi. He was one of the first suspects, and the police thoroughly looked into his whereabouts and movements on the day Mary went missing, and the following day, too. And that leads us to Alfred Cromelian, the ex-suitor who identified Mary's body. Mary is known to have called at his office at least two times in the days before her death. Although it's plausible that she came seeking money to pay for an abortion, it's also plausible that Cromelian might have believed that Mary had fallen in love with him again. When she told him that she hadn't, he might have killed her. But Cromelian, too, had an alibi for the time of the murder. He also made a nuisance of himself with the police during the search for Mary that it seems he had little to hide. Also, in Poe's theory, the killer also knew Mary back in 1838, when she first vanished. Neither Cromelian nor Daniel Payne knew her three years earlier. But there was someone who did know Mary Rogers at the time of her first disappearance, tobacco shop owner John Anderson. His interest in Mary seems to have exceeded that of a typical employer. Mary and her mother lived with him for a time before purchasing the boarding house, and when Mary quit her job at the cigar store, Anderson is said to have literally got on his knees and begged her to stay. 
Anderson's business grew steadily in the years after Mary's death. He invested in real estate and became one of the wealthiest men in the city. For all his success, though, it was impossible for him to escape from the suspicion that he might have had something to do with the death of the beautiful cigar girl. Rumors spread that he had been having an affair with her, leading perhaps to an unwanted pregnancy and its deadly consequences. He had managed to suppress the information that he had been interrogated by the police in connection to the crime, but the stories about him didn't stop, creating the impression that one of New York's leading citizens had a very ugly skeleton in his closet that he wanted to hide. This seemed to destroy any political ambitions that he had. At one point, political power brokers tried to encourage Anderson to run for the office of mayor, but Anderson declined, fearing that the publicity would cause even more speculation about his links to the Mary Rogers case. He grew bitter later in life and frequently blamed Mary's death for thwarting his political misfortunes. His business partner, Felix McCloskey, recalled one occasion when they walked past the place that had once been the Rogers boarding house and Anderson cursed the young girl's memory as the cause of driving him out of politics and belittling him in New York. On another occasion, McCloskey quoted him as saying, I want people to believe that I had no hand in taking her off, but then added that he hadn't anything directly himself to do with it. That's a statement that seems to leave a lot unsaid about what Anderson knew and when he knew it. Years passed, and Anderson became involved in the spiritualist movement, the belief that the dead could and did communicate with the living. He confided to several friends that he was now in regular communication with Mary's spirit. He said she appeared to him in the spirit from time to time. I have had a great deal of trouble about Mary Rogers, but everything is settled now. I take great pleasure in communicating with her face to face. An attorney who looked into Anderson's business affairs in later years said that the murder made an impression which he was in after years never able to shake off and which, when his faculties began to fail and old age creep upon him, lent a controlling force which undermined his intellectual powers. Anderson eventually withdrew into a mansion in Terrytown, where he installed steel-lined shutters to ward off a threat that he was unable to name. He came to believe that his children were trying to poison him and that his cook was plotting to kill him by putting pins in his roast beef. Anderson died in Paris in November 1881. He was 69, and he had outlived Mary Rogers by 40 years. At the time of his death, he was widely believed to be insane. Some said that Mary's spirit had driven him that way. As a result of his mental instability, his heirs would contest his final will and testament for more than a decade. It was during this period of legal wrangling in May 1887 that discussion occurred about Anderson, Poe, and the mystery of Marie Roget. There was a claim that Anderson had hired Poe to write the story to draw suspicion away from himself. No evidence exists to say this did or didn't happen, but it is not as far-fetched as it might seem. It should be remembered that Poe and Anderson were acquaintances, and that Poe, as the author of the ill-fated conchologist's first book, would have been known by Anderson as a man willing to undertake almost any sort of hack work for a price. It should also be noted that in 1845, Poe took over the helm of a magazine called The Broadway Journal, and that two weeks later, advertisements for Anderson's Tobacco Emporium began running in its pages. At a time when Poe desperately needed money to save the struggling magazine, Anderson paid in advance for three months' worth of advertisements. He was the only tobacconist in the city to do so. While this does not prove that Anderson commissioned Marie Roger as a smokescreen, it is certainly interesting. There's also a bit more. Felix McCloskey, Anderson's business partner, later testified that Anderson had told him that Mary had received an abortion the year before her murder took place and that he got into some trouble about it. Outside of that, there was no grounds on earth for anybody to suppose he had anything to do with the murder. Although McCloskey's memory of dates may have been a little off when he recalled this 50 years later, it does suggest that Mary's first disappearance came about because of an abortion. Whether Anderson was responsible for the pregnancy or merely paid for it is unclear, but the recollection that he got into some trouble about it certainly explains his sensitivity about the murder as the years went by. Even if Anderson had nothing to do with the events of 1841, which remains an open question, he would have placed himself in a delicate situation if he had provided the money for the earlier abortion, 
especially if Mary died while undergoing a second operation three years later. Even if, as he later claimed, he had no hand in her taking off, his part in the earlier abortion, whatever it was, would have branded him as a villain who helped set her on the path to destruction. Given the level of outrage about the case, one can only imagine Anderson's thoughts as suspicion turned against him. But if the killer wasn't John Anderson, then who could Poe have gained his intimate knowledge of the crime from? Was he covering up for someone else? Or worse yet, could the writer have been involved in the crime? There are those who have claimed that Poe did indicate the murderer in his story, although he did not name him, and that the murderer was Poe himself. A few theorists have suggested that Poe met the young woman while visiting the shop of his friend, John Anderson. If Mary did have an abortion three years before she vanished, perhaps Anderson encouraged her to become involved with some of the well-known and often wealthy clients of the store. Could this explain a relationship that Poe might have had with Mary, if a relationship existed at all? It had long been suggested that Poe engaged in romances outside of his marriage, and by the time he returned to New York with his wife and mother-in-law, Virginia was already ill. This could have driven him into the arms of Mary Rogers. However, by the time Mary died, Poe was living in Philadelphia. He stated that he only learned of the case in the newspapers. But could he have been in New York? It wasn't a long journey between Philadelphia and New York, even in 1841, so it's possible that Poe could have made the trip. But was Poe capable of murder? At this period in his life, Poe was oppressed by poverty and a lack of literary recognition. He was continuing to fight his battles with alcohol, and his wife was dying. To his family and friends, he appeared physically, if not mentally, ill. Poe's state of mind was mirrored by many of the characters in his stories. He gave his literary creations the opportunity to indulge in crime, murder, and bloodshed, and it's been suggested that these characters were simply the darker side of Poe himself they committed the deeds that he would never dare to act on himself. Or would he? Could Poe, in a moment of mental or alcohol-induced frenzy, have surrendered to the dark instincts that he kept trapped inside and allowed the bizarre behavior of his written characters to emerge? Could he have killed Mary Rogers? Most would say no. But behavioral psychologists have demonstrated that criminals often give tips to reveal their identities to the police, especially those consumed with guilt and with a subconscious desire to be caught. Was this what Poe was doing when he gave his decisive hint about the identity of Marie Roger's murderer? The writer was, just like the killer in the story, described as dark-skinned, with a full head of black hair falling over his large forehead. Before we go any further with this, I will step in and say that this is very unlikely. As others have found, though, it is intriguing. There is, of course, no evidence to link Poe to Mary Rogers' murder, aside from that he probably knew her, frequented the cigar store, and was acquainted with John Anderson. Even so, there are many who argue that Poe simply knew too much about the case. His story was just too detailed for a man turning a newspaper story into a fictional tale, Poe did rewrite portions of the story to fit his imagined facts and, as we'll soon see, made even more changes before it appeared in a collection of his stories. But does that point to his guilt? Did he know things about the case that no one else possibly could? Did he really know what went through the mind of a killer? Again, probably not, but it is interesting to consider how literary history might have been dramatically altered if Edgar Allan Poe was literally creating his own tales of murder and horror. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can also email me anytime with your questions or comments through the website at WeirdDarkness.com. 
That's also where you can find all of my social media, listen to free audiobooks, shop the Weird Darkness store, sign up for the newsletter to win monthly prizes, find my other podcast, Church of the Undead, and find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression or dark thoughts. The Beautiful Cigar Girl is a true story and it's a chapter from Troy Taylor's book Nevermore – The Haunted Life and Mysterious Death of Edgar Allan Poe, currently available on paperback and as an audiobook. I've placed a link to it in the show notes. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marlar House Productions. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Proverbs 13, verse 16. A wise man thinks ahead, a fool doesn't, and even brags about it. And a final thought. I have learned that what we have done for ourselves alone dies with us, but what we have done for others and the world remains and is immortal. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the weird darkness. <laughs>